true believers. Welcome to a breaking all down vlog video review or vlog week review of Doctor Strange, which I just got out of seeing in 3D IMAX. Also, I'll be discussing the film. I'm going to try to keep this generally spoiler free. And if any spoilers do slip through, they'll be at the minor level background detail, not major plot points or that sort of thing. And I'll also be kind of talking about what format you should see this film in if you haven't seen it already. So, quick, spoiler-free description of the film's plot. Dr. Stephen Strange, surgeon, brilliant surgeon, is, um, gets in a car accident and, lose, and loses the dexterity in his hands, so he's no longer able to practice his craft, seeks, after modern science fails him, mystical sources to regain the use of his hands to their former dexterity and ends up training underneath the ancient one in the arts of sorcery and has to ultimately fend off an attack upon this dimension by acolytes of the dread Dormammu. So probably the closest I have that synopsis to anything vaguely spoilerish is the mention of Dormammu because the big D's name has not shown up in any of the marketing materials. That said, I kind of figured the Dormammu bit was coming. In the lead-up to this film, I went and I read a whole bunch of the early run of Marvel Comics on Marvel Digital Limited, or the early run of Doctor Strange. Um, I've been going through the complete Marvel reading order at cmro.travis-starns.com. I'll put the uh, link in the show notes below. And possibly also in the annotations over on this side of the annotations, but you know what I mean. That stuff. Yeah. On uh, how to get there. And so I read the first two major runs on Doctor Strange. Lee, the Lee Ditko run, which is the, the origin of the character, and the follow-up run with Roy Thomas and Gene Cullen. Conan, yeah. Cullen. Or Conan. Whatever. Gene. Roy and Gene. Eugene Colan, Colan, C O L A N, not O N. Anyway, reading through that run, and I picked up a few bits from that that I hadn't, that gave me some tidbits I hadn't noticed before, and let me make a few educated guesses, namely about the bad guy being Dormammu, because in the comics during the Lee Ditko run and during the Thomas Colan run, uh. Dormammu, who is in the comics a perfectly humanoid uh, figure, looks looking almost perfectly human except for his mystical energies and some bits about his appearance, has dark rings around his eyes, like like they're sunken into his head. Kind of like, not like reverse um, raccoon face, but like, I guess I'd describe it as like the classic zombie corpse makeup. With like, imagine the white corpse paint with, not like eyeliner, but like straight up black rings around the eyes themselves makes someone look like a corpse. That Think like that with the Dormammu in the comics. And we had a bit of that as far as like the dark portions around the eyes with the uh, villain of the film, played by Mads Mikkelsen. I'm gonna try to look up the MDB so I get his name correctly. So that kind of tipped that bit off. So, let's talk a bit about the cast and the performances. We have uh, a pretty good cast here. The performances are excellent by all of them. And we're the big four, five roles in the film are Cumberpatch as Strange, Chuatel Ejiofor, whose name I hopefully have not mangled, as Mordo, Tilda Swinton is the Ancient One. Actually, like, six major characters in this film. Uh, Rachel McAdams as Christine Palmer, who is Doctor Strange's ex, and who serves sort of as a grounding figure for Strange when he comes back up in the later act of the film, sort of giving a, mon a much better mundane perspective on what the goings-on once Strange and the world that Strange has stepped into once Strange has become so immersed in this world. His perspective has shifted. And we have Benedict Wong as Wong, a character who had that name in the com the, first, the character was named Wong in the comics, 
it happens to be a perfect coincidence that they cast a very talented Asian Asian actor as him, and Mads Mikkelsen is the film's antagonist, Ken, uh, Cassilius. So, how does the film honestly go? It it goes great in a lot of respects. The film has does a great job of capturing the visuals of the comic. One of the things with Doctor Strange as a comic book that where it puts fall into where it fell short with the 1970s backdoor pilot for a television series, and those would be is why the television series, why it would never would not have worked as a television series during that time for budgetary reasons, is Doctor Strange kind of lives in two worlds. Now I mean the world of the mundane and the world of the mystical, but in terms of from vi from a visual perspective, two worlds are the world kind of of horror and the world of psychedelia, and trippy, magical visuals. There is a story, is a backup story in Strange Tales, which has, this is back when Strange Tales had, uh, as the lead-in feature, I want to say, um, yeah, it was when it had um, Human Torch stories as the lead-in feature, where they dropped the torch and brought in Nick Fury, and had Doctor Strange as the main feat, as the lead-in. And the story had Strange, Doctor Strange investigating a haunted house. And hearing report, he reports of this haunted house being haunted and goes in and he exercises the ghost. And this is during the Lee Ditko run. And the visuals here are very dark and somber and gothic. And fits with the fact that in the comics, in the comics, if you look at Doctor Strange, he's very clearly modeled on probably one of the most iconic horror actors of the 20th century, Vincent Price. To the point that if I was making a 1960s Doctor Strange movie, or making a Doctor Strange comic that was or film that was contemporaneous with the comics, I'd have grabbed Vincent Price, like, for, I'd be the first actor I offered it to, and he'd probably take it. So there's that side of the equation. The other side is straight up psychedelia. Whenever Doctor Strange starts going through the planes, the astral plane, the dark dimension, the dream dimension, any of these other worlds, we go straight into trippy visuals that are just I'm not going to say that make you wish you dropped acid before. I'm not into you know, the drug stuff, but it's very psychedelic very non non-normal isn't the right word but very out of the ordinary sometimes kaleidoscopic sometimes completely chaotic and without pattern but in interesting ways and the film does this both both these parts well it doesn't go as much into the horror portion unfortunately maybe the second Doctor Strange film will capture that side of the equation. From what I understand, the plan for way for the next phases of Marvel after Infinity War to get into more personal stories, and getting into the horror side of Doctor Strange would be definitely a place to go for that film. I guess the better comparison would be, mm, but yeah, um, for for the other world, the other world is more conventional sort of superheroics. I will say. With a little bit of from not a little, not a little bit, but a, a chunk of martial arts action, it actually kind of borrows from the Doctor Strange animated film, direct video animated film that was made by Marvel Studios a while back when they were considering that approach for the uh, for adapting the main Marvel comics properties to smaller screens. It takes a bit from that, but with the the astral plan, the the psychedelia part, the film captures that perfectly. We, there's a sequence in the film, we get a bit of that in the trailers and in some of the other promotional materials on the Marvel YouTube channel, which involves Doctor Strange going through all sorts of psychedelic images, kaleidoscopic stuff, other, when he's learning about other worlds and dimensions from the ancient one. And it's really interestingly well done. It's 
I'm kind of interested to see how much of this effects here are practical and how much are CGI. Because there's some bits that are clearly CGI, which are getting into weird levels of fractal imagery and that sort of thing. But there are other bits where they transition in between that remind me of paint tank photography. If, you're, if you've seen old 70s and 80s science fiction films, and fantasy, certainly fantasy films as well, but particularly science fiction films like The Black Hole, like Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and like the Flash Gordon live-action films, and you've seen paint, photogra paint tank photography in action. They do a bit of this. Sorry about that. I ate lunch before I started recording the vlog. They even do a bit of this as well in Quaidan, in the opening. But it's... These other science fiction films do it on a much broader level, with multiple colors interacting with each other and clouds billowing outward and that sort of thing. The way this works is you have a giant tank of water. A tank of water of various sizes. Big helps a lot, depending on how much you're doing and your distance from the tank and that sort of thing and what you're doing with colors. And you pour, and basically you put colors and uh, paints and dyes into it. Maybe you pour, maybe you pour some in. Maybe you had to take like, basically like a turkey baster or something similar, and you fill it with paint or dye. You stick it in there and you squirt it in, and you record how the inks and paints and dyes billow out and move in patterns and clouds and that sort of thing, based on their various weights and that sort of stuff. That is paint tank photography, and there's a whole bunch of shots in this film which clearly pay reference to that. Not done in, they're done in CG, in, probably done in CGI though, probably all done in CGI, but it, I appreciate using, even if they're not doing practical effects directly, using practical effects as a template for addition, for future photography, for, for the, the digital effects. It's a good bridging of the gap, bridging of the balance there, or keeping the balance. I'm mixing my metaphors. So there's that. Performances, very well done. Benedict Wong is excellent as Wong. In the comics, Wong is a figure who is oftentimes, unfortunately, like particularly during the Lee, Ditko, and Thomas Colin era, he is a figure who is often can be buffoonish and basically is there to say, oh, this thing is impossible. I can't believe that Doctor Strange accomplished this and bizarre task where he knows enough to know that what Strange is doing is impossible and to describe what Strange is doing but he's not actually he doesn't feel helpful is guess the way to describe it whereas here he is his role is the keeper of the library library of the ancient one he is not as powerful a sorcerer as the ancient one as Strange or Mordo are or the film's villain are, but he is competent, he is very intelligent, he is very knowledgeable, because he's a librarian, he doesn't know what things are, and kind of, okay, I'm looking for, you're looking for information on this, you need this book here. It's, he's a librarian, he's a, he's a battle librarian too, because he, his job is to protect the books as well, and he, he and so he's, the, the way the character is written, Fits well with Wong's strength, Benedict Wong's strengths in terms of. Actually, I, I can't say too much about keeping with his strengths. I haven't seen enough of his work, but Benedict Wong's performance really plays him well as a character who is who maintains a front of severity and seriousness, but he has his elements of smartassery as well. So. Got that. Uh, Joe Hotel Edgeforce character is Mordo. He, I mean, it, this film could have the problem of, well, Green Lantern, of uh, we are theoretically setting up a character as a mentor figure in this film or a friend character in this film to be a villain in, in the next film and fall flat on several respects to make it not work. Whereas, here, the character of Mordo, he has very clear reasons for doing what he does. He is... He is not the villain of this film in the slightest. He is... He, he keeps his position of where he is when Strange meets the Ancient One in the comics. 
which is he is another student, another pupil of the Ancient One. But he's not villainous at all. He's not planning to kill the Ancient One and usurp their position as the source supreme as they are in the comics, as he is in the comics. And his motivations for doing what he is and for being what he is and, and doing what he does are just oh the are just eternally consistent, but they've made but they set up with a specific worldview where you can kind of tell to a certain degree why this person came to the ancient one. Without it being spelled out, you can get an idea. This person came to the ancient one, maybe not for this specific reason, but for this level of reasons. And now that they are with the Ancient One, they're staying with them for these reasons and staying with this fight. And then when they're, when he is at his end state in the film, which I'm not going to spoil, for his internal philosophy it fits, which makes sense for Chiwetel Ejiofor as an actor. When the films that I've seen with him as a villain in them, he he feels like the actor who, if he was offered a <laughs> villain role, he would say no. He would turn it down. He wants a villain with some depth to them and some acting breadth and chops. A reason for that character to have this worldview. Not just this villain is a hero of their own story, but this villain, they have very specific reasons for doing what they do, or potential villain, because in Mordo, not a villain yet. But potentially in a future film, but not in this film. Mordo is a fake character who has philosophical worldview reasons for doing what they do, for doing what he does, for being with the Ancient One, and again, being in the place where he is at the end of the film. Mads Mikkelsen's character also fits as Cassilius, where he is, he has reasons, he has very clear reasons that in the personal worldview philosophy for doing what he does. And when, and while yes, like some anime and stuff will have, oh, I wish to end chaos in the world and make everything better by stripping everyone in the world of free will, or destroying everything, or I will save the world by wiping out humanity and returning life to its proper order, proper balance, or whatever that sort of crap, like in X. But it's a, it's a very shallow take on philosophy and a, a worldview. Whereas with the character of Cassilius, the same sort of thing. He has reasons behind his philosophy. And while from what we know as the audience, his decision is the wrong one and is ultimately harmful for the world and people in it, it makes sense that from his worldview and from the information that he has accumulated, for him to make this decision, even if he... And to make it for the wrong reasons... And it alt and he ultimately is acting on wrong information. That's okay. People make decisions based on bad information all the time in the real world. It's okay for bad guys in movies and heroes in movies to make decisions on ba on bad information as well. So there's that. Um, I missed most of the trailers. Um, other bits. Oh, IMAX in in 3D. So the film absolutely benefits from being seen in IMAX because of these trippy psychedelic vid visuals that we get. The semi-paint tank visuals, the kaleidoscopic visuals we get in some of the major confrontations. They work because they are in... They work really well in 3D and because oftentimes they're digital effects, they fit well in 3D. It's a, it's a well... It's a film that benefits. It has the depth of field that makes a good 3D movie anymore. You can't just make a 3D film and have popping towards the camera. You have to have depth of field to get a good 3D movie. And this film gets that. The director gets that. Even this film was perhaps not natively shot in 3D. The post-processing process gets that and makes those visuals heightened and feel more dramatic because of the 3D effects. As far as IMAX goes, going from the credits, the film was shot natively in IMAX, and that may perhaps be the best argument for seeing it in IMAX in 3D, 
Apparently, if you can get the right, if you can find the right seat in your theater for having it the most in your frame, the film most in your frame, and the where the 3D effects work the best. If you can get that seat, definitely IMAX 3D. If not, maybe conventional theater, but still in 3D. I think the main reason why I would probably go for IMAX 3D over regular 3D is IMAX theaters tend to get... The problem with 3D in films is if you have the a lower wattage bulb in your projector or you're an older bulb in your projector and they're not taking care of it well, 3D can be too dim. And having the film in 3D in IMAX, it's less likely to have that dimmer bulb. So there's that. So... That pretty much covers my thoughts on Doctor Strange. Oh yes, if my room seems weird and different between this video, next week's video, and the video after, that is because while I was at KimuraCon, I was having my had my uh, these my recording space, room office space painted, some other painting dapping around the house. So that is why the room the space looks different. The video after this, which is the next installment of Legacy of the Force, which is the Force rather, has was recorded prior to the painting, so ne you'll be getting alternating back and forth for November. So anyway, what do you think of Doctor Strange? If you enjoyed the film, and if you have any additional thoughts or analysis you want to give, and if uh, just general thoughts in general about the Marvel Cinematic Universe and where it's going any films in particular coming up that you'd be interested in seeing my thoughts on, please post in the comments. Try to keep them spoiler-free, just in case other people haven't seen, who are watching this video haven't seen it. At least keep them spoiler-free th through through December. By the time Rogue One comes out, open season. But let's, through December of 2016, let's keep the spoilers to a minimum. We'll give people a good like month or so to watch the movie. Let it go through the main theaters or and into the second rounds, second and third rounds. So, thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.